Okay, great, thank you. All right, so welcome to everybody. Um, today is a webinar from University of Florida for um, students that are interested in a PhD here on our campus. And we have two different populations that might be um, logging in today. Uh, one group are prospects that are attending um, another institution. You might be attending another institution in the United States. Um, you might be attending another institution globally. I know we have a lot of international students with interest. Some of you are currently in a bachelor's degree and some of you are currently in a master's degree and even some of our own University of Florida students. But all of you have one common goal in mind and that's uh, to obtain a PhD in your future in engineering or computer science. The other group of students that we have uh, could have some logging in today as I also sent messages out to some of the applicants for the spring 2024 term. So some of you have already applied, you might have already received your admission decision, you could be waiting, but the majority I believe today are for prospects for the fall 2024 term. So we have uh, quite a few experts here to chat with you today. We have a lot of staff who are really knowledgeable about the ins and outs of PhD admission, the process, uh, funding options, and lots of other uh, questions that you might have. So we're gonna start off um, with some introductions of everybody, and then we're gonna uh, go through um, some slides and give you an opportunity to ask all of your questions. Is Toshi able to join us today? Doesn't look like he's here. Okay, so uh, one of the high-end uh, deans in our Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering is Associate Dean for All of Academic Affairs, Toshi Nishida. Um, I was just in a meeting with him this morning with uh, the faculty chairs of each department and the other deans in our college, and he's quite busy. He's usually double or triple booked uh, at any given time. So. Uh, there's a chance he could join us at, at some part uh, during this, but he's uh, at the top of the chain for overseeing a master's and PhD enrollment here uh, in Engineering University of Florida. So I'm Mike Nazareth, and I know many of you have heard from me. Uh, you might have got an email from me maybe last year and this year, maybe only recently in the last couple months. I've sent out a bunch of PhD application fee waivers. Uh, but we don't just have one here, we have many. So certainly uh, several of our departments and graduate staff could have also sent you some PhD application fee waivers. And you'll hear from me today and, and throughout this whole year in the enrollment process. Hi, I'm Ashley Wilson. I'm the coordinator for graduate recruitment and I assist Mike with helping all of you on board. It doesn't Christina. look like Krista's on yet. Okay, move on to Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Sapp. I'm with the Computer Information Sciences and Engineering Department. I do the graduate admissions and the recruiting. So if you have any questions for the master's or PhD program, I am your person. Hi, everybody. My name is Julissa Nunez, and I'm the admissions officer for the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. I'll be happy to help with any questions related to ECE. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula Jones. I'm the Graduate Academic Program Specialist for SE, which, as you can see, is Civil, Coastal, and Environmental Engineering. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. I will not be able to be here for the whole entirety of the event, but I will put my email in the chat for you. Hi, I'm Pam Simon. I'm with Engineering Education. Um, I am doing the graduate admissions for our department and some of our graduate advising. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Sharpshare, and uh, I am the Graduate Academic Advisor for uh, Industrial and Systems and Engineering. Um, I do advising as well as um, with the admissions processes as well. Work with them. Hello, my name is Tahara Franklin. I am an Academic Advisor for the Material Science and Engineering Department, as well as the Nuclear Engineering Program. Hi, I'm Megan McMahon. I am the Recruitment and Admissions Specialist for Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Okay, so that's our lineup of uh, graduate staff that are here to assist today. And then uh, if Krista joins us, uh, we'll have an introduction there. 
And I just can't stress enough of how critical and important these employees are. When you send in your PhD application, they are going to go, it goes into the Office of Admissions, but really it's going to these individuals. And they're the ones to make every step happen for your potential admission and funding offer. So you really need to stay uh, in, in contact. You'll get messages from me and Ashley, and we'll answer your questions a lot, but they're the ones to make things happen. So that's very important. We have some of our current PhD students here to also chat with you. Hi, my name is George Adidokun. I'm a third year PhD student in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Hi, my name is Robert Thomas Lattis. You can just call me Tom. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student in electrical and computer engineering. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. So um, we should be able to assist you greatly throughout this next hour to an hour and a half. Uh, so what we'd like to do now is I'm going to go through a series of slides about University of Florida, about our uh, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering and missions. And I will ask some of our um, PhD students and our graduate staff to chime in at various times and give their input and their advice and their guidance for you. But you can start receiving assistance now. So if you have questions, feel free to type those in uh, the chat area now. You can direct those to specific individuals just for the area that you're applying. You can direct those uh, in general for everyone, uh, but we don't need to wait until the end. So ask your questions throughout to make the be best use of everyone's time. And at the end of our uh, slides today, if there's still questions or ones that uh, have been asked multiple times, then kind of Ashley will review some of those and we can respond to those uh, for everybody. So a little bit about University of Florida, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, especially for some of uh, those of you with interest from other countries, is we're one of the largest institutions in the United States. We have over 60,000 students, many, many buildings, hundreds of buildings, thousands of acres, and we've been around a long time, more than 150 years. So we certainly are one of the preeminent places in the, across the United States. Um, the preeminent place in the state of Florida, but certainly one of those across the entire United States for academics and, and for your studies. You can see that we have a lot of graduate students. So some universities are, are focused on undergraduate. We are focused on both here. We have a lot of undergraduate students and we have a lot of graduate students. And those are not just master students, but PhD students as well. So there is a community here um, every PhD student focuses on a specific area in a specific department in a college, but there's a network and a community that spans across the university. And we have lots of colleges and lots of faculty uh, to work with our graduate students. We have a lot of research expenditures too. I remember doing this presentation not so long ago, just maybe three years ago, and we were in the seven or 800 million range, and then we crossed 1 billion, and, and lo and behold, over 1.25 billion this year was the latest press release last month. And that's pretty important because those research dollars, grants, and expenditures, those help to fund the PhD students. And I know funding is very important, uh, probably for all of you, uh, so we have those resources here for the students we're admitting. Our Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering is also quite renowned and been around a long time, more than 110 or 15 years. Uh, we are one of the oldest ones in the U.S. and one of the largest. So you can see when there are 60,000 students here at University of Florida, that uh, 10 and a half to 11,000 of those are for our college here in engineering. So you're very well represented. Uh, many of those buildings on campus are engineering and, and scattered throughout. And we have a large graduate population as well within engineering. So 30% of the students here are in the graduate program and that really helps to expand uh, all areas that we're working on with our faculty, with our courses, and with our labs. 
If you want to see the specific breakdown, here's a chart that I put together uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This is from fall 2023 enrollment. So of our 3,300 plus graduate students, you can see how it breaks down among every department for those students enrolled, including our, including our newest department, which is engineering education, which is just beginning for their PhD students. And then they will have master's students themselves starting next fall. So we're revving up with that and taking applications uh, on that as well. So it spans across all areas. And we have virtually all areas of engineering, including computer science, um, that exist here at University of Florida. We're very proud of our rankings. In fact, earlier this fall, a new ranking came out. And for the first time, we were listed as the number one public university in the entire United States. That's the 2024 ranking of Wall Street Journal. Uh, we have the links in there as well but we do quite well among all the rankings. And this year we're number six for US News and World Report. Those rankings just came out within the last three weeks. We've been five or six for three straight years. So we are right there with the best of the best. Uh, so not only do we want the best students, which is why we've been reaching out to all of you, but we feel we have the best quality product as well. So it's a win-win for the students and it's a win-win for our college and for our university. We have lots of departments, um, lots of areas for you to focus on. I think over um, this slide and the next slide, maybe we can have two of our department grad staff just talk a little bit about their department and, and highlight any particular area they want. And the departments uh, have rankings as well. So I know Paula had to maybe uh, step out a little early. Paula, would you like to highlight uh, any areas about SE? Sure. Um, SE, as I uh, mentioned before, has its three different programs. It has civil engineering, environmental engineering sciences, and coastal and oceanographic engineering. That can get a little bit confusing because we do have our only two departments, but we do have three programs in the entirety of those two departments. Um, we have 14 research specializations that when students apply, they have to indicate that on their application. We do have our list of funding opportunities open for PhD applicants right now. We have some for the spring for US applicants and we have um, a bunch for the fall for US and international applicants as well. Another department that in fact used to be not just the largest department in um, our College of Engineering, but the largest department on the whole campus, it might have been surpassed by another this year, but mechanical and aerospace engineering has always had a, a tremendous population. Uh, Megan, would you like to highlight any areas or talk about your department? Sure. Um, one of the things that I like to promote the most with our department is our student life. Um, we have a great social environment within mechanical and aerospace engineering. And just today, in fact, I judged our graduate student council costume contest for Halloween. Um, we like to have a lot of fun. Our students really like each other. Um, we also have a very broad range of courses that our students can take, and it's a very self-directed program. Your coursework and your degree plan is really what you want to make it, and we are very proud of that fact with our department. That's great. What was the winning costume? Was it a Florida Gator? No, it was Cat in the Hat, and it wasn't just the costume. It was uh, his willingness to stay in character. Oh, great. That's great. That's fun. Uh, so we have lots of buildings. Uh, you know, I, I pointed out earlier, we're almost like 10 by 10 blocks square, and then it's just everything filled in in between is our campus. But there's also eateries and other stuff, and I'll, I'll let our students talk about that here in a second. Um, when we created this slide a couple of years ago, we were approaching 60 buildings, but we've opened a couple more since then, so we had to slash that out. Uh, and it's very common that you would work in multiple buildings. So um, there are some buildings that are designated by major, but we've opened up some new buildings that are cross, cross departments, cross collaboration. And this is one of them, the Herbert Wertheim uh, Laboratory for Engineering Excellence has some graduate students, undergraduate students, lab spaces, student spaces, um, faculty offices, meeting spaces, all, all sorts of things. And it's across majors and topics. So we find that's really uh, the direction uh, that we're, we're heading here at University of Florida. So much so that we had a partnership with NVIDIA 
And uh, their founder uh, uh, had a degree as an alumni from University of Florida. And we want to be known as AI University. We've had one of the fastest uh, supercomputers in all of higher education. But now with this donation and upgrade, we will have the fastest. And artificial intelligence is certainly an area that is booming, as I'm sure many of you know. This is not just for computer science and electrical and computer engineering, but this is spanning across all majors. And even here at UF, we're trying to span it across all colleges. In fact, the new engineering education department is having two new master's degrees and one is in um, AI. So we have a new building for this. We've been working on this for two or three years and it is scheduled to open up next month. So um, Christina, I believe the computer and information sciences engineering is moving into this building. Do you wanna highlight some areas on this? So I don't know too much about it. Um, I did do a tour. That's about it. And we've been, like you said, we've been working on this for a while and um, we're super excited. It is uh, going to be beautiful and it's definitely gauged towards our students. And um, yeah, like I said, I don't really know too, too much about it. It's just beautiful and we have rooms and it's going to be amazing. So there's several departments that will be housed in here, plus a couple other colleges. So I know it will also be home of the ECE department. Um, Robert, would you like to talk a little bit about your program and just other uh, things you feel would be important uh, for a prospective PhD student in ECE? Yeah, so uh, the ECE program is one of the biggest programs here in the College of Engineering. There's a lot of Good collaboration among the graduate students here. We have mostly weekly seminars where a lot of students come and can listen to uh, research being presented from a fellow graduate student or a postdoc and sometimes a visiting professor. So we get to stay up to date there. Um, and so there's a lot of good research things to do. And uh, actually, currently, my lab will be moving into this new building uh, wow. next month. Uh, so uh, we are kind of at the forefront of AI. That's part of what my lab does. And I've heard that there's our, our new space will have a lot of collaboration between graduate students. We all uh, get kind of a student village where we all have uh, different types of cubicles and desk space for us to help collaborate together in this new building. So a lot of state-of-the-art labs, uh, state-of-the-art collaboration spaces. So I'm very excited. That's great. You two are a step ahead of me. I've only seen the plans on paper and on video, but I, I need to get over there and, and get a tour. I know other areas will be in there. The College of Pharmacy is going to have a floor. I believe this is a six or seven floor building. There'll be some College of Medicine interface, which is not just biomedical engineering. We have a lot of bio areas in mechanical and aerospace engineering, materials engineering, chemical engineering. So this can really span uh, across a lot of areas. So we have quite a few um, international students. So um, uh, our director of F1 uh, compliance that helps issue the I-20 visas. I know several uh, of you online today are international. Um, she was not able to be here for this webinar. We'll host admitted webinars again in the spring term, but she did send me her, her slides. So I wanted to um, push a few of these forward. Um, uh, George, would you like to highlight a few areas of this? Ah, uh, yeah. So the International Student Office has really been so like great, like, and even the reception for international students at CF has been so amazing. Like, I was able to blend in real fast, and the other good part is, for example, my department we have like the Graduate Student Council. And with that, you get to make a lot of friends and even the pressure of PhD, you don't get to feel it because you get to share everything around with people and you have so many people to talk to and to help you like move along with uh, your PhD studies irrespective. So with that, the international community here is really great and the office, they are always ready to help at any time. That's great. So another thing I forgot to mention when we started here is uh, don't feel like you have to write everything down today. Um, we're posting these slides online. Ashley will have them up by tomorrow. Um, I know I sent a bunch of emails out with the link that, that shows where all the slides and where this recording will be. Uh, 
But I also know you get a lot of emails, not just from me, but from and the rest of our graduate staff, but from the other institutions you're considering. We know you're considering uh, most of you several institutions. So there is a lot of extra steps for the international students with documentation and paperwork and uh, financial certificates to get the I-20 so that you can then go through this SEVIS process to meet in your embassy and get the F-1 student visa from your country so you can come over here. So we have this entire area designated just for that, the International Center. They will help you through all of this. Most of this would not even start until after you apply and then after you are admitted. And most of the applications are still coming. We'll get thousands of applications. We'll get probably 6,000 applications this year between master's and PhD, and only a few hundred have come in, but they really start coming in November 1 onward for several months in a row. So we'll stay in touch. We have all kinds of check-ins and deadlines and dates. Uh, so, so do know these are posted everywhere and that you can have these slides. But we also have a designated uh, individual for each of you. So there's 15 or 20 F1 student advisors in the International Center. And they work with all the prospects by their last name. So by the first letter of your last name or your surname is how they're going to designate which ones uh, to work with. So if you go to this link here on their website, um, there'll be pictures and names and direct emails of all of these individuals. So those are the ones you stay in close contact with along with your graduate staff. But really, this process is after you've been admitted. So everybody that applies doesn't get admitted. We would like for that, but the volume is just too much. So it's really, we're going to focus the time and energy on those after they've been admitted. So um, that goes into the spring term. Okay, so for the PhD degree, there are uh, several flavors of the PhD. You can see some of those here. Why don't we give um, Jordan in our industrial systems engineering a chance to chat a little bit about theirs and, and highlight any areas you'd like? Yeah, sure, certainly. Um, so we offer our um, PhD in industrial and systems engineering, um, also part of the, um, the PhD students are able to add a quant uh, concentration in um, quantitative finance, um, as well as also um, take courses that meet the degree requirements for the PhD, but also for a graduate certificate in quant or, uh, financial technology fintech. Um, so those are our two opportunities um, available to students um, in our PhD program um, that can uh, add to, to that degree. Okay, great. I'm gonna let uh, Tahara have a chance to talk about uh, material science and nuclear. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of this slide and between our 12 engineering departments, there are literally three or 400 different areas of specialization. There is just so much opportunity. That link on that page is the only page you'll find anywhere in all our Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering sites, which just sums them up. It lists each department and quickly all the areas of specialization. So do take some time. It will probably broaden your high, uh, horizons to a few things you did not realize that we do offer here. Okay, let's uh, spend a little focus on materials now. Hello. Um, so for materials, we also include the nuclear engineering program. There's a lot of collaboration between both our nuclear professors, our materials professors. We have a lot of collaboration um, with other departments as well, such as like BME and chemical engineering. Um, so materials is all about what makes things up, like what is you know, composed of things as far as chemistry and things of that sort. Nuclear is more about like power. And we have the nuclear reactor here. Um, we have a lot of facilities um, um, that our, our students and faculty are working in. Um, and so there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of social events. Um, and we do um, take care of our students. And so like even within our advising office, we have free coffee, students can come in and meet with us. We have a department pantry where students can come and get things that they need. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Great, thank you. Another um, area that all students don't realize is uh, we're really flexible here at University of Florida. 
for selecting your PhD degree. So you can be from a different undergraduate degree in engineering or even another major and then apply to a different PhD degree. So for example, you can be in electrical engineering in your undergraduate degree and apply PhD in electrical, but you could be biomedical in your undergraduate degree and apply PhD in nuclear engineering, or you could be in chemical engineering in your undergrad and apply PhD in materials engineering. So it does not have to be the exact same area. Of course, some of the, the focus and content and the classes should overlap. If it's completely different, then that would be a challenge. Um, but we do have many students that do, do go across that. So uh, we have admissions, uh, and I know many of you are wondering about that. So the first thing I did is this is the exact numbers for all of the students that applied last year to start this fall for fall 2023 across all our departments. So you can see we had almost 1,900 applications, about 25% were admitted, and about 34% of those enrolled. I've been here, this is my 10th cycle here at University of Florida, and over those 10 years, um, we are anywhere from 150 to 200 new PhD students each fall term. So that number fluctuates up and down since it was a little bit lower for fall 2023. I expect it to be higher for fall 2024. And that goes by funding. The students that come are funded. And so um, the grants with faculty or the dollars they have, that those pockets of money go up and down every year. So I do expect to see it swing some the other way for next year. Uh, maybe we can highlight um, a department or two to talk specifically about their admission. Um, let's see. Um, how about Jalisa in ECE? Sure. So um, in our department, uh, PhD admissions are uh, highly dependent on finding a faculty advisor. I saw somebody actually ask that in the question, so I thought I'd address that. It may be different for other departments, but um, you don't have to have an advisor in advance. But when you apply, we highly suggest that you um, reach out to faculty members in your area of interest. Um, so that they can know that you're available and that you're interested. It'll make a big difference. Um, and I've had a lot of questions about what happens if I don't meet the minimum requirements for your department. Um, so ideally, we want you to be able to meet at least those minimum requirements, but it's not a deal breaker if you don't meet those minimum requirements. So I would still encourage you to apply and then especially reach out to the faculty members so that they know that you're interested and maybe for whatever you lack in, you can make up in other areas. So it's really important to make that connection with the faculty member. Yeah, so we have some general requirements to apply PhD, but then each department may uh, have a few additional requirements or evalu certainly evaluate differently. It's not just the same standard admission bar for everybody for all departments that can vary. Uh, oh, maybe. If I can please add, I'm yep. so sorry, if yes, I can no. please add, in addition to the things that Mike has listed here, um, please make sure to check the individual department's um, website. Um, since everyone has, you know, their different requirements, maybe different GPA requirements, a uh, different number of letter recommendation, um, it's really important that you check uh, the website. For example, in the ECE department, we require that two questions be answered in the statement of purpose, and a lot of people miss that because they don't look at our website, so I'd highly recommend that you do that as well. Yeah, that's important. Um, again, we have a lot of things coming at you. you, you it, it would not be uncommon for five to 10 different offices to be sending you things just from University of Florida. And if you're applying to five or six schools, that times that by five or six, right? Um, but try to, you know, make your priority list of your top uh, school or two or three, and uh, hopefully we're on that. And, and, and to go and, and look in those websites because they do vary differently. And at, at University of Florida, you could apply for two PhD programs. So if you've received an application fee waiver, you could apply once and then submit a second application to a different department and apply again. And the admission process and decision-making is different in each. You could get admitted to both and then you have to decide which one you wanna come for, or you could get admitted to just one of them. Um, so that's possible um, as well. So these are some of the kinds of things um, that are needed, and we'll talk about those in a little more detail. Um, I'll let Pam uh, speak for a second because 
this is the newest program, the newest PhD uh, for whatever uh, she would like to highlight about engineering education. Well, as, as Mike said, as of now, we have 11 graduate students. Um, next week, we're going to have our first graduate student social, which I'm really excited about. Um, the program just started spring of 2023, and we will be building this program as quickly as we can. Um, so if you have any questions for me, please let me know. Okay, great. Thanks, Pam. So uh, continue to ask your questions in the chat uh, for any of the individuals online. If you're not sure who's online, if you joined us a little late, just put your department like CISE, computer science, B biomedical, and then one of our, our staff will see that or students and answer. So I just want to talk about this for a second because um, this, uh, this can be a little confusing. We do have a lot of PhD application fee waivers and we've been giving those out and many of you have received those. But there's not just one PhD application fee waiver for University of Florida for engineering. Uh, it would certainly make it more simple if there was, but sometimes, you know, universities have a way of making things a little more complicated. The reason there's not one is because um, we don't just get a waiver fee. We have to pay the application fee in place of you. So the application fee still has to be paid. We're just paying it out of our budget to the University of Florida Office of Admissions because that's a separate operation. So we, we each have different pockets of money. So I'm giving out all of them for PhD for US citizens or permanent residents. So there's a yes in all those columns. If you've received one for me, it has the deadline, pretty much most of the deadlines, the priority deadline is December 5th. Applications can still be accepted after that, but they'll be looked at later. So try, try to get them in. The application is not turned off. They'll still, you'll still accept them, but try to get it in by them for PhD. All of those other departments are giving out application fee waivers for international students, but not all of them. You know, we can't just give to everybody, just like I don't give to all US citizens. We have to look at a few measures and academics, et cetera. We don't want to give to some we feel who, who definitely couldn't be admitted or something like that. And it, this is, we do have limited amounts of funds. It's not unlimited. So those are the, in, the emails you contact for those departments. And then a couple of ours do not offer any if you're international. So I'm sorry about that. But the good news is we are one of the most economical in the U.S. It's $30 for the U.F., that says MS application fee, but it's MS and PhD. Either one, it's $30 for that application fee. Many institutions in the US, it's well over $100. So it is economical if you, if you had to pay for that yourselves. Do any of the other grad staff in the departments that are giving international application fee waivers want to highlight anything here for, the, for your students? Everybody's good on the others that are giving those? Okay. All right, so you will have to do a statement of purpose. So um, Robert, do you have some uh, advice for the prospective PhD students on writing the statement of purpose? Yeah, I think uh, for the statement of purpose specifically, um, what you really wanna focus on is you wanna show the university who you are and what you've done. Um, so just try and include, like you can see this bullet point here, it says uh, to highlight research, job, computing experience. So really talk about who you are, what you've done and uh, what value specifically you can bring uh, to your degree program and such. And also just why do you want to come to UF? I think a lot of people can overlook uh, that a lot of times in their application. And so, uh, but in the end, UF is uh, the institution you'll be applying to. And specifically, I think something that would help set, set you apart would be, why do you want to come to UF? as opposed to some other university. Um, so really look on the website and other things to find those specific areas of UF that, uh, and the College of Engineering specifically that really make it stand out to you. Great advice. Another key component to a PhD application is letters of recommendation. What other people say about you and vouch for you. George, you had to submit a bunch of these. What advice do you have? So for letter of recommendation, uh, I personally think it's really important because now the people that are going to you, the app, your application uh, package that you're submitting, nobody knows you. They've not seen you before. 
however, like your faculty that has worked with you or like your previous school or whatever has worked with you can actually give a good testimony of you. So I'll just say it's good to put a lot of energy on letter of recommendation. Get people that have worked that you've worked with faculties. Let them write a good letter of recommendation for you. It's as important as every other thing you're going to submit, and it speaks much uh, about you. If you are really very a good person and works really hard, uh, let the letter of recommendation highlight the best part of you and everything you can be. And these are the things that you're going to see and have to judge you on. Yep, that's great advice. Thank you, George. So I think, um, does one of the grad staff know, does the admissions application in the Office of Admissions, are they still allowing up to five letters that can be uploaded? Yes, they are. Would you like to address that with the prospects of the three versus five? So yes, and then I'm gonna backtrack too for our department if that's okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so letters of recommendations are really important. We ask for at least three, you can upload five. If you can't get five, that's certainly okay. It's not going to hinder a decision at all. Um, so letters, I will I didn't think letters of recommendations were as important as really they are. So for some of us, we'll look at if you're teaching us. So if you're going for a TA, a teaching assistant. So this is really important because they're going to look at your letters of recommendation and they're going to look at your score, where you scored between it was one to five. And they really do look at these so that it really is important to get your letters of recommendations in. Um, try to get as many as you can. Like I said, it really does help for TA positions, even RA. For our department, for the CISE department, um, I know they were talking about the statement of purpose and I wanted to back up to that. And then also I wanted to um, answer what Jalissa was talking about. We no longer require the GRE. For us, we have a lot of applicants that apply to our PhD program. We have, I think, 53 to 55 faculty in our department. I, I would say don't reach out to all of them. Um, they get overwhelmed with spam email where like they will super frowned upon with that. Um, well, our biggest thing, and I can tell you here again, the statement of purpose is important. So what happens is as you apply, you'll go through me. I get your application done. The faculty actually will have come to my office and they'll sit down and they'll go through the applications. So they're literally going through each of your applications. The first thing that they look at besides your GPA and your in your test scores is they're going to look at your letters, of, uh, your statement of purpose. First thing they're looking at, they're scanning through it, they're gonna wanna see where is your area of interest? Because if you're data science, but you're, you know, they're machine learning, if if it's a completely different field, then they're not even gonna look at you. So that's important. Um, So your statement of, of purpose is super, super important, just like your letters of recommendations. So yeah, get as many as you can in. Sorry, Mike, that was way more information than you No, had. that's great. When you said the one to five, that's an internal score that your department does to rank. Is that what you meant? That actually is on the um, letter of recommendation. So on the, they're not, so the recommender, and I don't know what the, what the- um, Oh, the recommender see. scores them. Yeah, the recommenders okay. actually score them and they, okay. and that's what we look at. Okay. So when you, you, some of you might not know this, uh, and uh, they're different at every school, but when you submit your PhD application, right before you submit, you put in the names and the emails and the titles of the people that would be your recommenders, and then that generates, they get an email uh, with this score sheet and, and where they can upload their letter um, after your application is submitted. So you would never see that, uh, that piece at all. Okay, so um, cost is very important for some students. This is the number one factor for for all students. It's uh, most students. It's certainly among the top factors. Definitely uh, picking a quality institution with a quality product is very important as well. Uh, I'll let one of our uh, other students chime in here. George, would you like to talk about uh, moving from another location to here as far as costs and, and how you feel that's gone? And the value? Uh, so relatively, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I actually moved from like Nigeria to China to this place and uh, to the UF and 
cost has really been okay. Um, I'm on, I get funded, so I don't really need to worry so much about anything. And I get my stipend uh, every two weeks, which is enough for my accommodation and for every other thing I want to do. So it's been, it's been great. I'll just say that. That's good. Thank you. So these charts uh, show, uh, I, I pointed out before that we were number one in the Wall Street Journal for public universities, number six in U.S. News and World Report. Here's the other 10, the total 10 schools. And we come out in the top as far as the tuition, the cost, uh, cheaper than the other ones, more economical, and then cost of living for the town for some of these. So if you're if one of your decisions is among top schools, Definitely also look at the city, the location of where it is, because that uh, could could double your cost, depending on how much you have to spend on some of those areas. So funding is really important. Uh, virtually all of our PhD students are funded. Here's some of the packages. Most of our students do receive uh, the average five years. Some finished in four, four and a half years. So I will let uh, some of our grad staff talk about their specific areas. Um, how about um, Megan, would you like to talk about uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Fellowship? Sure, I would say that um, we offer about 10 HDRA fellowships per year. Um, it varies year to year, but I think 10 is right about where we're sitting. Um, and that does cover four years of funding at an at a higher rate. So for instance, for fall 2023, our GRA stipend for normal admission students was $30,000, but our HDRA fellowship students received $34,000. So they mm -hmm. got quite a lot more money than our um, lower, uh, our, our other admits. Um, so that's something to think about when trying to uh, fill out your application. You want to put your best foot forward because at least in our department, if you are flagged as a top recruit, you can expect a much larger financial package than some of our other students. Okay, great. And, and each department has a little bit different twist on how they make these offers and when they make these offers. Um, Tahara, would you like to talk about some of the offers uh, in materials and nuclear? Absolutely. So the Dean's Recruiting Award is um, handed out by our department chair, as well as individual faculty. It's based on students accepting offers from faculty. Um, so when you are applying, um, as you've heard other departments say, you don't necessarily need to have um, a faculty identified. Within our department, we work with students to identify faculty. And then once they have received those offers, those faculty have first did at requesting the Dean's Recruiting Fellowship Award. Now, as far as our department, we do have a minimum stipend um, that students um, are given. Every student is given a stipend of at least 30,000. I think this fall 2024 is going up to 32,000. That includes tuition, health insurance. Um, so we do have guaranteed funding within our department for PhD students. Yeah, so we have a couple ways that this takes place here at University of Florida. And again, it, like you've heard, it varies between departments. One is you could get a, a an offer letter that says you're officially admitted PhD to University of Florida. And then we have a visit day, which we'll talk about for students that reside in the U.S., whether they're a U.S. citizen or international. And then for the ones that just give the admission first, invite you to the visit, after they meet you and interview you during the visit, then they give funding out offers out at, during the visit or after that. That's one way we do it. Another way is some departments just send you the admission and funding offer all together at the same time. So you could be in, in either one of these. And then those offers are usually multiple year, the four or five year, but we also have many of these others that are one year awards, but don't get hung up on the one year, they're for the same value they're renewable every year. And as long as you're making satisfactory progress towards your degree, then they're renewed each year. And it's in everybody's best interest if PhD students start and are doing well to keep them until they graduate. Nobody wins uh, if, if they leave. And so we we just have, uh, we have two buckets of money. We have the multi-year awards and then we have these one-year awards. They're all good awards um, to get. 
There's other fellowships uh, that exist on our campus and nationally, if you win one that can be used here. One is McKnight. McKnight is a state of Florida award. If you get this, then you can use it to go to any of the public universities in Florida. You can go to this website and see uh, some of their, their latest, their application process. Um, if you get any of these awards, it only enhances your awards at University of Florida. Because the way we look at it is you would have some of your funds paid for so that we could take our funds and just add it on top of that. So we could add some on top of these existing awards. There's a bridge to the doctorate. This is for students within the US that are a part of these specific LSAMP programs. Um, there's just many different kinds that are that are part of your, your research and your, your searching out. There's lots of national awards. NSF is certainly the most prestigious. These kinds of awards, DOD, NIH, SMART, they pay some of the highest stipends. They actually pay for everything for one, two, or three years. So if students get these, then we give them lump sum payments on top of it, kind of one-time top-off awards or maybe for multiple years. So students can really just put anywhere from 2,500 to 10,000 or more in your bank account savings because we're actually saving tremendous amount of money if you pick us and, and you're, you, you have all the funds to go for the first several years. So do apply for some of those national awards. Some of these can be restricted. If you're an international student, some of these you have to be US citizen uh, to apply, but there's a great deal of them that, that you can search for. And I know we have some listings of those on some of our um, websites. We have other areas here, uh, research institutes. These are centers that are around a topic. So they're not a department, you're not admitted to any of these, but you can work within these in your PhD program and they have a variety of uh, PhD students across disciplines. For example, the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research would have a lot of students from CISE and computer science, a lot of students from electrical and computer engineering, but they could also have students um, from nuclear engineering. They could also have students from industrial and systems engineering. So these are added things that you can work with. And some of these institutes and centers do have a few additional dollars or some uh, offset fellowships that they could offer the PhD students. So we have the spring visit, and this is for students that reside in the U.S. So if you reside in the U.S., whether U.S. citizen or international, and you're admitted PhD, then hold these dates. And I listed that in the um, application fee waivers that were sent. And this is where we fly students in. We will have between 175 and 200 students that are here on these days. We pay all costs. We'll buy your flights, or if you're within a couple hours, you can drive and get mileage. I booked the whole hotel close to campus, your meals, events. So it's a great event. You not only get to see more about us, we not only get to interview and learn more about you, but you get to meet the other students that would start here as PhD students with you, your cohort. So that's very valuable. Um, Robert, were you involved in the spring visit in your, your second year, you said? I was. Uh, I visited uh, uh, after I'd been admitted to the university and it actually played a pretty significant part in me making my decision to come to Florida. I was able to meet with faculty uh, and get to know them on a more personal level. And I think that also uh, helped them be confident in their choice to choose me as uh, their student. Uh, and I just really enjoyed the time. The university pays for your flight out and uh, lodgings and all of that. And so uh, it's a good time. And a lot of the fellow ECE students I met there, I still see in the halls and we have good friendships. So I would recommend it. And I know Robert's not just saying that because he's actually on the Engineering Graduate Student Council this year, and he's helping to plan the spring visit for in 2024. So that's great. So if you uh, uh, submit your PhD application and you're admitted and you reside within the U.S., then expect to be hearing from me and from some of our department graduate staff for invitations. The earliest invitations for that go out just a week prior to Christmas break with a few departments. And then the bulk of them go out the first and second week of January. And if we haven't got them all out by then, then we go into the third week of January. So uh, getting a job is very important. That's probably also on the top of your list. If you go through all this, if you get a PhD, what do you do after? What's your career track? So we 
heavily assist our graduate students, actually all of our students with this. We have an entire operation dedicated to this. It's called the University of Florida Career Connection Center. And their goal and mission is to help all University of Florida students, bachelor's, master's, and PhD with jobs and with internships. We host the largest career fair in all of Southeast United States of America with over 600 companies. We did that for a couple days in late September. We have another one in January, early February, and we have hundreds of companies and uh, they individually visit UF every week of the year also to meet with students. That picture right there is in our basketball arena that seats 14,000 people because it is so big we have to host it in there. Um, George, did you attend uh, since you've been here? Have you been a part of the Career Fair or the Career Connection Center? Yes, I attended the last one. Uh, I think from, was it last month? Yeah. It's, it's really great. Like I, that was actually the first time I was attending and there's, there's actually diversity meetup. Uh, you get to speak with different uh, recruiters, even without having to talk about recruiting, just to know about the company policy and every other thing. And then you have another three days of different companies coming in and different sessions, technical, non-technical sessions. Uh, you get to speak to a lot of people. You see companies that do uh, visa sponsorship for uh, international students and the one that does not. So you just see, you get a lot of options and uh, it's it's really a massive one. This was my first time attending it, and it was really really great. I had to I got a chance to speak to a lot of like recruiters, and I get to understand what's going on in the industry. And another thing to hide is that the career connection center they are really great at helping you to get your CV ready and just look through your application package before you even go for it. So you're all set and good. Good. I'm glad that's been very helpful. So uh, we have another grad staff that slipped in at some point, but I just didn't notice that because there's too many things going on here at once. So I'll let Krista introduce herself. We have individual career fairs, not just the main one. I'll let her also talk about that. And Krista, if you'd like to highlight anything else about a biomedical engineering program. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was late. I could only participate for the second half of this session today. I apologize. Um, Yes, so I am the grad, I am Krista, I'm the grad advisor for UFBME. Um, as Mike mentioned, we do have um, exclusive events for our students um, that are career focused and um, professionalism focused. Um, first one we have every fall is Alumni Connect. Actually, we just had it um, this past Tuesday, I believe. Um, <clears throat> alumni Connect is when we bring in, obviously, alumni from our program, either at the undergrad or grad level, to come and talk to our students about their career paths, um, what made them choose um, the position they're currently in, uh, what the a day in the life of that position might look like, and that could be industry, it could be um, academia, it could be a federal position, it could be anything um, that a BME student might go into, including um, like maybe a postdoc, if they've um, gotten a graduate degree from our department, a doctoral degree from our department. So um, we really get a lot of a great turnout for that event. We also have Industry Connect, which um, kind of self-explanatory, but we bring in industry partners, biomedical industry focused companies um, to come and speak to our students about their uh, projects that they have going on. Um, sometimes they're alumni from our department, sometimes not, um, but they are companies that we have a connection with um, one way or another, and they come and give presentations talk to students individually, take resumes, talk about co-ops, internships, um, new positions that they might have available for students that are looking. So um, if you're part of our department in the future, you will definitely hear about uh, hear more about these events. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and did you want to highlight anything about BME for um, all the other departments have chimed in at time? 
anything just about PhD admission or fellowship or what you're seeing or advice uh, for this next cycle? We have at yeah. least half international students online too. Okay. Um, one thing about the application process for our department, I will say that we have modified our application process slightly. So for the statement of purpose, um, we have very specific um, questions that we'd like to see applicants address in our personal statement or statement of purpose. So please make sure you're looking at our admissions website for those uh, directions. Uh, we're not allowed, we, we don't have the capability to modify the online application. So you won't see them there. You have to go to our website to find those. Um, if you have any questions, you can definitely email me. Um, I'm sure my contact information will be up there at some point, but I can also put it in the chat. Um, just generally speaking about a doctoral degree in our department, um, one thing that I think sets us apart from others is our um, co-localization to the UF Shands Medical Campus. So uh, we are actually on the further end, further south end of campus um, from the other engineering departments, um, closer to where the hospital is and the McKnight Brain Institute, um, all of the um, medical focused um, buildings are located. <clears throat> We're in the biomedical sciences building, so the Diabetes Institute is also in our building. Um, a lot of collaborations are fostered by the closeness we have to all the medical school facilities and physicians and clinicians that are running around nearby. Um, and half of our program actually curriculum wise is what we call specialization electives, which can be any graduate course in the College of Medicine or the College of Engineering. So our curriculum is designed in very intentionally in such a way that you can choose kind of choose your own path um, you can tailor your curriculum really based on your interests so i think that's one thing that um, kind of distinguishes us amongst our peers happy okay. to take any questions in the chat if you have any okay good thank you and there's only a, a small number of institutions um, across the u.s where the biomedical engineering department is literally right next to um, the hospital. And that's very important for that particular major. So you're not traveling or getting in your car, driving across town or things. So that, that's very important. That's also the second department that mentioned there's extra questions and to answer those in your statement of purpose. So please make sure uh, you're following that up because they are looking at that um, for the admissions decision. So many of our departments have these additional career fairs on top of the big one that we host um, for all of uh, University of Florida. So there's just more opportunities for you. Um, Jordan, would you like to uh, talk about yours or highlight anything else that's been missed for industrial and systems engineering? Um, so yeah, we did um, also just recently have our um, ISE career fair. Um, I actually have um, met with students recently um, who have, you know, obtained um, internships and positions um, through that event um, and subsequently had to make uh, changes to their academic program and whatnot. Um, so it is a um, an event that is uh, widely attended by students and um, potential employers. So I get lots of questions uh, year round about students that um, are interested in business because they want management, but we have engineering management in our industrial and system in engineering department. And that seems to surprise some prospects. So if that's an area you're interested in, then we certainly have that. Okay, I'm gonna um, let Ashley run the next couple of slides so we can move, take a shift from academics in the university to the town. Hey everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about housing on campus and off campus. Um, there's a lot of different on-campus housing options. This is just kind of scratching the surface. Um, the link below gives you some information on how to apply for graduate housing or family housing and also gives you some more content to how many 
different housing locations there are. Just some brief ones are Quarry Village, Diamond Village, Tanglewood Village. Um, those are all pretty commonly used ones and you can find the applications for those as well on the link below. Some off-campus housing, um, there's a website called Swamp Rentals that gives you um, the price ranges, locations, uh, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, everything like that, where you can look up what's available around Gainesville as well as apartments.com does. Um, UF also has a housing locator, which I've heard from many students that they use and it's pretty resourceful for them. There's also different ways that you can apply to find roommates if you need that option. Um, a few housing options that I've looked around and pulled up are um, the Ridge at Gainesville, the Pavilion, Cabana Beach Apartments. All of them are um, remotely close to the university. The city of Gainesville has the RTS bus system that has bus stops throughout almost all of Gainesville, goes to the mall, goes to Celebration Point, which is a large uh, shopping center with some malls, restaurants, and all these bus stops are throughout campus as well. And this is free to UF students with your ID. Um, Robert or George, did either of you have any comments about your housing experiences or maybe some locations that either where you live or some of your friends do? Yeah, so I stayed at uh, the Continuum. I think it was on the previous slide here, uh, my first year, and I really enjoyed it. It was it was good housing. Um, so right now I'm I live in a duplex with my family because uh, my wife just had a baby, so we had to expand a little bit. But uh, the Continuum is a great option for students. Uh, I actually walk to campus. It's a little long walk for people, but you can easily bike or even take the bus. The bus stops right there. So there's a lot of good housing options and. Uh, a lot of ways to choose from and I recommend using these these links that they put here in the slides that'll help you a lot. Great thanks. George do you have any comments about it? Yeah so for me I live in a shared apartment which is pretty cheap like like, like $395 per month so I'm not really paying too much and I have friends that I really live on campus and it's so comfortable on campus and cheap compared to even trying to like rent apartment outside. So I was saying it's like, you get whatever you want. You want to leave I, you get it. If you want to like leave on the cheap, you get everything. That's the consensus that I've seen is that there's lots of variety. There's pretty much any kind of housing you can find either on campus or off campus. Um, UF is really big on our sports, especially football. We have a large stadium, and as you tell from the picture, it's always packed out. Um, we also have a large following for baseball. Um, I do know that a lot of our on-campus sports tickets are free for students. I don't believe that goes for football, though, um, but I'm pretty sure all the other ones we do. And UF also has some intramural sports, like currently they do um, – Frisbee, cornhole, bowling. Um, there's about 16 different sports that they're offering right now. If you go to the rec sports page for UF, they offer different sports each term. And then the city of Gainesville itself, I am a Alachua County resident. I've lived here my whole entire life. Um, the Annual temperatures usually um, average around 81. We're actually starting to hit the spot time of the year where in the morning it's been pretty cool, but by the end of the day, we're back up in the 70s. Feels very nice. Um, we're very close and central to both the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, beaches both ways. It's about an hour drive to both sides. Um, St. Augustine is a super popular beach that everyone goes to. We're relatively close to Tampa, Orlando, and Jacksonville, too, which are some huge cities if you're looking for or more of like a city life um, vibe on the weekends. It's always a great time. And then these are just some photos of the different areas, such as um, in Orlando, they have Disney World, Universal, some other amusement parks, and then some photos of the beaches around town. And then we also have a good nightlife here in Gainesville as far as... Um, bars and areas for students to hang out. Um, Georgia, Robert, do you guys have any 
comments about just the area, anything around or in Gainesville that you like to do? Yeah, so some of my favorite things that I've done uh, around, there's a small town outside Gainesville called High Springs. Um, they have a lot of springs you can swim at. That's that's always really cool and a big favorite. And then UF also has uh, a lake that they own called Lake Wahlberg. Uh, and it's about 10 minutes off campus. And you can go, they teach you how to uh, sail, like in a sailboat. And they also have kayaks you can rent out for free and everything. So I, I like all the nature things. And so some of those, some of those are my favorite things to do. So. Great. So I'll say the, like the most common things to do around Gainesville is just like the springs. However, yeah. if you're like me and you can't plan so many things yourself, the rec sports used to have different courses whereby they organize trips. And if you're interested in so many things like hiking, learning to swim, or even sail, go across town, you can just up on the rec spot, just look for something to do. They always like have a little trip, very cheap and interesting. Great, thank you both. Okay, great. So um, we're wrapping up here soon. I'll ask Ashley if there's any um, questions that need to be answered uh, for all. Um, if you did not um, fill out that top link to request a PhD application fee waiver, then please do so. Um, that's mostly for um, U.S. citizens and permanent residents, but can also be passed along for the departments that are doing international um, considering for fee waivers, and you have that previous slide um, that has those direct emails for those individuals. Again, all these slides will be posted tomorrow, so you can see them online, the link that was in your email invite to attend this, um, and then we'll have the recording um, as well. So that's a general admissions link there, but then as you heard today, each department um, has theirs as well. This is the direct link if you didn't have it. That's where we post all of the slides and recordings for all of our events. This is actually the second uh, Thursday in a row. We're doing uh, webinars for four straight Thursdays for uh, many, many more than 1,000 prospects uh, for master's and PhD. Here's the uh, direct information for the graduate staff. So many of these were online today. A few of them were not able to be here, but that doesn't mean that they do not want to assist you and answer your questions. Uh, there's just many things going on all the time when you're at a university of 60 plus thousand um, students. So you have their information uh, so they can be especially helpful for you. Uh, George and Robert were here today, but here's some other PhD students that also are very interested in helping some of the next group of students uh, to enroll. But this is not by no means all of them. We have more than a thousand PhD students and I can personally connect you to many PhDs uh, along with our grad staff in any area that you're interested in. Okay, so um, are there any questions at this time that we can answer that have been repeated throughout? One question I've seen quite a bit is um, when they should be expecting fall 2024 admission decisions. Yeah, so that is a good question. So I will let some of our grad staff uh, take a stab at that. We do like the priority deadline of December 5th for the applications to come in. We still have some coming in after. Um, who would like to answer that that's online? Christina, you want to start? Sure. So for us, um, I know we start sending out probably the end of January, especially for our U.S. Ph.D., applicants that we're going to admit like mike said we have the spring visit coming up in february so if you get an invitation most likely you're going to be admitted because we're obviously not going to want to bring you if we're not interested in you so somebody's interested in you um for our international it could be as late as february march before you know anything because our faculty are always always checking the applications and there's so many of them to go through so it could be as late as that but yeah as early as january for us mike, chime in if that's okay yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you mike mentioned um earlier there's different departments do admissions differently so bme is one that admits sends admission offers after the visit so we will 
invite you to the spring visit the end of February. It's a, a time to have fun and socialize and get to know the department and our current students and faculty, but also it's an interview process. Um, so if you're invited to the spring visit by us, we're definitely interested in you, but we will not send admission offers until shortly after that. So at the earliest, it would be the beginning of March, but it can go as late as the end of March. It just depends on when faculty are ready to make an offer. So if anybody has more questions about that, happy to answer those. That's I think we're probably the anomaly in the college when it comes to that, but there might be other people who do that as well. Other departments? Um, so for ECE, as uh, Christina was saying, you'll hear as early as like, you know, later January um, for the people who are gonna be invited to the spring visit, but it's not uncommon for our department to have people lingering out there for a few months. And I know some people will not like that, but I, what I'm trying to let you know is that um, faculty members uh, sometimes will get grants a little bit later or they just haven't had the opportunity, like if they lose a student or if they get money from somewhere, they need that extra time. So we like to let the application sit out there for a little bit longer to give you guys the opportunity to still get an offer. And then after say like around probably April, if you haven't been admitted, then at that point we convert leftover applications to the master's program for master's consideration if you don't already have a master's degree. Um, so times can really vary. You'll hear very early if you come, uh, if you're going to come for spring visit. But if your uh, application is hanging out there, don't feel too discouraged. We're still looking at the applications. We just have to make sure that we have an advisor for you because for our program, we do not offer admission if we don't have funding for you. Um, I will follow that as our system is very similar. Um, domestic applicants, um, if you are a spring visit invitee, you will likely hear from us in late December um, at the latest, the second or third week of January. Um, for international students, your admission is contingent upon um, funding. So once you apply, really we need to reach out to faculty and secure a place in a lab. Um, and if you don't uh, contact any faculty, then it is less likely that you will find funding. So make sure that you are being proactive in those endeavors. Um, and then similarly, if by mid-April you have not been placed with a faculty member, meaning you have not made contact and an offer to work in a lab has not been made by a faculty member, then you will be considered for master's. Um, so please make sure that you are um, reaching out to those faculty after you apply so that they know to look at your application and consider you. Okay. That's also the same for engineering education. If you don't have the funding, you will not actually be made an offer for the PhD program. Okay, Jordan, ISC. Yeah, within ISC, um, generally uh, students can expect to start, um, like we start sending out uh, decisions usually towards the end of January. Um, offers, um, funding offers are sent out um, with admissions decisions. Um, and however, um, unlike the other departments that just spoke, um we will not um we will accept students that do not have um funding lined up um prior to um the end of you know the the cycle essentially okay and is tahara still there i think that's the last of the ones Hello, yes, yes, I'm still here. Um, so for material science, we start sending out decisions um, late December, early January, especially for our students that um, we are inviting to spring visit. Um, and then as far as our international students, those decisions are normally rendered in February. And then if there are any students that um, we cannot offer admission to for the PhD program, then we will automatically consider them for admission to our master's program. Um, when we do send out the letters for admission, those letters do include funding for one year. Um, like Mike stated previously in the sessions, that funding is renewable annually. 
dependent on um, successful academic um, progress. Um, however, I will say that um, within our department, if you do not have a faculty advisor, we will give you up to one year to identify one. Um, if after that one year do you, you do not identify a faculty advisor, we will work with you to um, earn a master's or you will just have to leave the PhD program. So for the departments um, in the last uh, 10 or so years, I would say um, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and materials nuclear have done a pretty decent job of getting those first round offers out before Christmas break. So in that third-ish week of December. The others have really been January. And this is for the domestic students, but then international has been a little later. But um, this is probably news to some of the graduate staff, but in the meetings that I've been in last week and this week with all of our deans and our college and all of our department chairs, the push is to do all of this quicker and to provide those initial offers sooner, whether they're just admission or admission and funding. So it would not surprise me if this cycle for the first time uh, for fall 2024, that many of these PhD decisions are made sooner. If they're not, it will be exactly as what you just heard, but it could be that it could all be pushed up a little bit more. Okay, any other questions, Ashley, or we've we been on for almost um, an hour and a half? There was one more that I think would be good to okay. um, bring up is, who should they get letters of recommendations from? Okay, who has advice for who these three to five letters should come from? I'll go first. Okay. So for us, we're wanting to have letters of recommendations from your academic professors from your previous school, because that's who's going to be able to better judge you on how well you did in class and your academics like that. So that's who we prefer them from, is your academic professor. Okay. And that, that makes a lot of sense because when you think about it for all the prospects, the ones that will be applying PhD, our faculty all have a PhD. And so they value what other faculty, other individuals who have a PhD have to say about you. So really that's primary. If you don't have three or so from faculty, you couldn't have one from a job or an internship or something like that. Um, but uh, it plays the most weight if it's from uh, faculty. I think the, the big area where I've seen where there's a little caveat to that is if you've, you've been out working for a while. So you graduated a long time ago, and then you've been working. So it might not be so easy to get three letters from faculty. So you will see some from their industry or their corporate um, there. Okay, so I think we've done a good job of covering a lot of topics and really getting into the detail for all of you. I can see we have almost the same number of participants of when we started to right now. So that tells me that you're all very interested. So we're happy to hear that. Um, we are very interested in you as a prospective PhD student as you are in us to come here to University of Florida. Let this be the beginning and that we keep staying in touch all the way through the application and uh, the enrollment process. So thank you for your time today. Again, we'll have the slides and recordings out tomorrow, no later than Monday. And um, stay in touch with any of us that you've heard from today. And uh, we'll see you later. So thank you. Bye, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ashley.